Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Jack Algier. I'm the director here at Stone Barn Center. And I have been uh, managing and overseeing this beautiful property here and the farm uh, since we opened in 2003. Uh, I'm going to talk to you today about uh, land management agreements, specifically about the value of uh, mutual agreements and how to get the best out of your community surroundings and the members in your community and to uh, be able to establish enduring relationships um, with a broad complex group of community members. So I'm gonna take the screen now. And so this is about agriculture and land use agreements, reestablishing mutualism in our local food culture. As most or all of you know, um, our relationship to agriculture as a society has been quite diminished, um, not just uh, from a biodiversity perspective, but from a cultural perspective. Um, and the unfortunate thing about this is that the value of agriculture in this uh, industrial paradigm equates food production uh, with extraction. Um, it's largely understood by a population that is non-farmer that um, agriculture is in fact um, generally taking from the land rather than being restorative. And by and large, that's true on an industrial scale, on a global scale. Um, that is an obvious problem for uh, the land and, and the people that, that live on that land. And um, it really viewing the, the system as a whole as a commodity rather than uh, a wonderful uh, a kind of um, asset and uh, the equity of our work, of our planet. Uh, this perspective has really degraded our planet and our health and our trust. Um, in some ways, trust in a food system, but also um, because of our disconnect of agriculture, um, it has created a lot of division. I really like this quote by E.F. Schumacher, management of the land must be primarily oriented towards three goals, health, beauty, and permanence. The fourth goal, the only once accepted by the experts, productivity, will then be attained almost as a byproduct. This is uh, a beautiful statement and uh, one that I think has taken me uh, decades to continue to understand. Um, as, as everyone here, I grew up in a, a society that, that largely values um, economy as the primary value set and that even as a farmer um, who has been in a community of a caring conscious um, aware uh, food citizens it still comes down to whether or not i can make a living um, so how much i'm selling that product and what i'm taking so a statement like this is really nice to read but it's also really hard to uh, embody because I think you might agree with me that this is a true statement. Um, it requires everyone that's involved in, in a conversation or in a transaction to really appreciate this deeply, to be able to take it to the next level and, and actually appreciate the health, beauty and permanence that exists in caring for land growing food and caring for animals and, and building uh, food communities on a regional and on a local scale. Today, I wanna to talk to you about um, 
my relationship to this beautiful land here at Stone Barns and uh, in Bacantico Hills, we are about a half an hour north of Manhattan here. Um, so a landscape as, as broad as this, as a natural landscape is rare and something to really, uh, uh, something of an honor to really be able to care for anyway, because of its uh, sort of unique character. There's about 2,500 acres of open forest and pasture land here in, in uh, the Rockefeller State Park Preserve and the surrounding landscape for which Stone Barns is nested sort of in the center of. Um, Stone Barns has run as a diversified farm for the past 20 years or so, 18 years. Um, and in that time, we have uh, taken on a relationship with the State Park Preserve, um, not only as a neighbor, but as a, a long-term partner and land steward. In this uh, process, we've, we've really looked to try to uh, work together to care for this land, but realized that there are a lot of people involved and there's a lot of history in this place to really understand. So um, while I'm telling you a story about this space, what I've really learned is something that I, I believe is uh, translatable for you on any piece of land really, whether that's uh, further out in rural areas um, or suburban or even urban settings that everything I'm gonna talk about today, I hope that you can find uh, a way to adapt to your situation and that you might get something out of this, uh, this workshop. First thing I wanna talk about is just the test of time. Um, knowing our place is the most valuable thing we can do to help support the reverence and, um, and care that we're going to give to it. Um, just like a family member, that the more you know them, the more you recognize all the parts of them and can appreciate that and, um, and recognize that there's history and lineage. So a few things to be aware of is just one, the actual geology of the place and the agricultural history that's there. Uh, the acknowledgement of the diverse cultural heritage that have been there. Uh, to remember that agriculture was here well before colonization and that the way this land here was managed um, is, is something to uh, acknowledge and to recognize the values and uses for land stewardship beyond our own personal interest. Um, it's my goal to protect habitat and to raise food for our community and to innovate new ideas. But it's not the only idea, the only set of ideas. Um, and also to develop enduring community agreements and communication channels. As time goes on and you know you make an agreement over time, we, we end up in situations where new people get involved. Uh, people that made those agreements move on, do different things. Um, no one remembers those conversations. So it's really important to uh, take record, to write down what you think would be obvious in the moment that in the future could be easily forgotten. From my perspective here, um, there's a few basic tenets that establish agriculture in the rest of our society and to uh, make, uh, make it something of a part of the way we manage climate and environment and that sort of thing. So to say that agriculture is a social and ecological act is a truth that I think it's really important that um, we continue to acknowledge that um, real agriculture, the kind of organic 
regenerative agriculture that everyone is striving for is a physical act of social good and ecological good, something that allows communities to work together. It allows ecology to thrive, soils to thrive. Its role in our society is to keep up, uh, is to keep us connected with the land, our health and each other. Um, a great uh, conservationist, uh, Peter Forbes once told me, uh, listened to him in a, in a workshop years ago that said, uh, when talking about conservation and preservation, that, that the land is not a pickle. And I always like that uh, phrase because I think what happens is we get into these relationships with protecting land and, and we're, we're afraid to, um, we're afraid to do anything on it. We're, we're afraid we'll hurt it and that we, will cause more harm than good. And, and that is a dangerous precedence to set among uh, humans on this land, is that we can know that what we're doing is something to reconnect and to help and to do something that's generative. We can start and encourage this by establishing agreements within our community that benefit the land and our food culture at the same time. I want to share a couple of things. First of all, to share the difference between ownership and stewardship, and that there are a lot of different ways you can protect land and you can make agreements with uh, others in the community. There are private ownership and management agreements. You can work for someone, you can own it yourself and care for it. Uh, you can lease or rent that land. Uh, there's some issues around leasing and renting that um, those terms to me, it sounds like renting a car or leasing a house. It's not a physical, it's not a place. It's a, it's a, it's, it's a physical place. It's not something that, uh, it's something that we will care for and it will uh, change in, in our presence and keep going beyond that. So it requires some other agreements. A license agreement, which is what we technically have with the state park, which is to uh, a long-term agreement that is a set of uh, interests that allow to allow us to farm on this land while being uh, responsible to hand over a management plan and, and stay within the bounds of the conservation goals of the park. Um, cooperative management agreements. Um, these are for landowners that want to work with uh, additions to leases and rent agreements conservation action plans and agro conservation action plans. Um, like what I'll be talking about later in this presentation is what we actually did to attach to a license agreement. Land trust agreements, right of ways, land trusts, um, nonprofit missions, even public access and open space are all ways to uh, be able to set agreements between landowners, state land, um, trust lands, agriculture, and conservation. I think really the best thing, though, um, when, it's, when we're talking about actually trying to engage community is that the legal agreement, whatever that is, a license agreement or a lease or something like that, um, gets combined with an action plan. For me, legal agreement plus action plan equals real community engagement. Because without the action plan, there is not a living document. It's just a paper that's filed away. And it really is a lowest common denominator. It's important for legal problems, things that come up, you should have a legal agreement and you should have an action plan. Because it not only shows that we are responsible to have done something, it shows us how we would go about doing it and it gives us all a responsibility in the process. Um, because really at the end of the day, you're not, it's not just about you and who you're leasing from or renting or buying from that land. Um, it's about embracing community complexity. In this community here, we're dealing with stone barns as a 
very diverse, ecologically driven farm, the state park preserve, a local government, other partnered organizations, uh, a range of ecosystem research and academic institutions, birders and naturalists, hikers, runners, recreation, horse riders, carriage drivers, hunters, private landowners, neighbors, community gardeners, local businesses, artisans, and chefs. Um, and that is a huge group of people with a lot of different intentions and needs and values um, of this place. And it does require um, the consent of everyone for this to work in the long run, because everyone on this list is a valuable uh, contributor to the health in the long run. So I just want to talk about this term mutualism and hope that it might set in with you, uh, because many agreements set up, agreement is uh, to me not quite a strong enough term. Um, if you look in a natural system, the ones, the bonds that really last longest are the ones that are most mutual. They, these are bonds that are symbiotic, that benefit both the organisms involved or all of the organisms involved. And it's also a doctrine that mutual dependence is necessary to social well being. So I like thinking about our systems as, and these agreements as being mutual conservation agreements. Um, because it holds us in check. Um, we need our partner. It's not just an agreement to allow us to do something. Um, without each other, the quality of our work, the uh, potential of our work degrades. So really understanding the shared values that we might use between these spaces, it's important to be able to recognize and, and name natural resources, Elimination of herbicides, reduction of equipment, carbon sequestration, habitat restoration, food production, uh, the improved animal health of working in conservation spaces, the quality of the organic products, the, the hide and the bone and the, the wood, um, the open space, the clean water, the public access and community equitability that everyone has the capacity to be able to participate on the land. Just to share some of our principles here in the way we look at this farm, really just designed to mimic nature. That the soil biome is the foundation of life on the land. That healthy systems are diverse and interdependent that each species performs a set of unique ecological services in every ecosystem. That mixed dynamic systems exercise the soil and energize habitat biodiversity. There is no waste. Mature complexity accommodates resource utilization and co-production. And the ecosystem is a living archive one that can tell us the history of the place in a moment. I'd like to point out that this kind of work can, uh, and this kind of thinking uh, can be applied to any um, kind of land stewardship. Uh, in grasslands and forest ecosystems, in our work on the park preserve land and forest, uh, the use of all of these species here, the poultry and goats in the forest and pastured animals, grains, and clovers, um, all of these species playing a very specific role in the system, being applied uh, as um, participants in a diverse system. It also works well in agreements for market farming, for flower growers and for beekeepers, seed savers, vegetable farmers, um, having land agreements that allow for and actually promote good practices, good soil practices that actually um, 
establish values beyond economic values. It's an important place for us to establish in, in any agreement that has to do with caring for land over long periods of time. The same can be said, as I've learned, um, actually maybe even more recently, is about community gardens. The really interesting thing that I, I've learned is that many of these wonderful community gardens that exist in, in the towns and cities around us and across this country um, are on vacant lots or in open spaces. Um, the, the common thread here is that most of these gardens, even if they've been there for 40 years, are still considered temporary. Um, and for that reason, very much at risk in terms of um, if they'll stay there. You know, in some ways, it's sad to say that they are essentially just placeholders for a new building. And that's not right. And when we go to speak to our town governments and city governments and local communities and land trusts and garden trusts that we do our best to make sure that the community understands not only that it's holding the ground, it's actually a place for the community to come together. So now for the next uh, 10 or 15 minutes or so, I'd like us to go through uh, our conservation action plan here uh, at Stone Barns. And uh, I'm gonna pull this up quickly. Uh, this is a, an action plan that we wrote um, originally in 2017 to accompany what we have as a land license agreement, which allows us to manage approximately 400 acres of pasture land within the Rockefeller State Park Reserve. And um, this also extends to some of the private landowners who own pasture land that's adjacent to the preserve. Um, the park preserve itself is quite extensive and receives a lot of visitation. The park preserve is a historic carriage park that has been open to the public for uh, nearly a century and um, generations of families in this community and around the local area um, appreciate the almost 60 miles worth of walking trails and riding trails. Um, it is an absolutely gorgeous treasure. Um, the state itself um, has always had some sort of agriculture on this land as they've taken it on to preserve it. And so when we decided to make the agreement to uh, care for this land, we wanted to make one thing really clear, and that's that our first priority was to use agriculture to protect the biodiversity protect the watershed and to build the soils. Um, raising the animals and raising the crops and anything that was on this space was really meant to be um, a product of that great work. The first thing we did was really establish some goals is that we, we wanted our system to work with resilience and uh, respect the self-generating, self-regulating rules of, of natural systems. We meaning to develop animal health through adaptive rotational grazing. Uh, we have anywhere between 60 and 100 head of cattle, approximately 250 head of sheep. At the moment, about 75 goats and uh, a herd of pigs, anywhere between 40 and eight. Uh, 800 to 1,000 hens. We're also working to build native biodiversity, um, including native field wildflowers and native pollinators through these rotational grazing systems and management practices, improving forage quality and soil conditions, um, controlling invasives uh, without the use of herbicides and as little mechanization as possible, our goats and pigs are the primary means for that. One of the main um, goals is to reestablish ground nesting birds, uh, obligate 
pasture nesting birds like the bobolink and savannah sparrow and meadowlark. And also develop holistic grassland management systems that can be shared by other parks. That has led to the relationship and partnerships with lots of other people um, and it established a lot of science to back up what we made promises for. So we work with lots of universities and academic institutions, um, soil labs and other ecology labs, and have worked with lots of uh, professionals in the space, Terragenesis, um, Rise of Terra with Jill Clapperton and Nick Dyson with uh, John Lundgren in the Dakotas. In developing this work, we felt that it was really important to be able to establish a stakeholder agreement and to find partners to help us design um, a way of looking at this agreement that was living and active and respected all of the members um, as stakeholders, the earth, our co-creator, um, to be able to inform and improve individuals' ability to plan uh, stewardship, customers and participants in the organization, funders of the nonprofit and the work that we're doing, uh, funding for the science and funding for the programs and the general community. Um, in this process, we really um, recognize that the data that we're talking about is really complicated and required us to build a database um, and focus on ArcGIS as a sort of central um, data hub for all of this information, the grazing information, all of the plant biodiversity, bird habitat, soil science, carbon, um, insect data. Um, so we spent the better part of 2019 uh, building the framework for what um, allowed all of our uh, archiving that was happening in Excel and uh, in notebooks to get integrated through ArcGIS and through story maps. Um, a lot of strategy went into making that happen. Um, and again, more partnerships to be able to develop the architecture and tools. Uh, just to say that I'm really grateful for the organizations that are out there, um, nonprofits and, and other great organizations that um, really we rely on to be able to uh, not only have data for this place, but to be able to share that data with other organizations and other farmers in the region um, to A, get better at the work that we're doing and B, to be able to uh, get this information more uh, comprehensively out to the public so that they can really use it. Um, one really exciting thing that we recognized is this the capacity for us to build apps for record keeping. If any of you are doing any record keeping on your farm, you'd know that it's likely you write something down once and then again and then again as it goes from notebook to Excel sheet to the next format or a report. Um, so some of the new database systems, and in this case, using mobile app development like Survey123 allows us to build in-house apps that allow us to do things like follow our animals around and track the pastures that they're working in to um, count birds and nests to um, record transects for plant biodiversity. Um, again, more partners. The more data we have, the more we can share it and the more we can receive information back, not just from other uh, ecologists, but from other farms and from restaurants and from other organizations that might be uh, looking at this from different lenses. Again, some of the things that we're looking for on the farm um, is to reinforce this idea that livestock impact and health are connected, that the health of the ecosystem and the health of the animal um, and the practices of the livestock husbands um, are one and the same, that uh, 
um, in this picture here, as we're looking at the different colors represent different species and their rotational grazing maps. Um, having this database allowed what had been scribbled into notebooks for decades to show up and act as a living working document for us to map and to share. Um, a certain amount of beauty in this as we look at the, the greater property and we see um, darker and lighter colors showing the, the movement of these animals across the landscape through the forests on trail edges and in open pastures. Also allows us to check soil conditions and map out our soil sampling data across the 400 acres and to map um, what we believe in, in many ways with soil testing, um, it's long been my feeling that uh, soil tests should always accompany your intuition. Um, they shouldn't replace it. Uh, if you're spending a lot of time on the ground and spending a lot of time with the land, uh, don't second guess yourself. Uh, the, the tests that you take um, should only be building what you know. Uh, not replacing that information. So these soil tests and the kind of technology we want to be applying on this work are really important to, to reestablish uh, your confidence. Carbon sampling also, long-term data collection. In order for us to even do long-term data collection, you need to have long-term relationships with the land. There can't be a threat that you might have to change your modeling or your, your methods. There can't be a threat that you're, you're going to get kicked off the land. Part of building an action plan and having agreements that are long-term established with your partners is that the details around how you're going to do this are, uh, to the best of everybody's intentions, enduring. These are plant habitat, transects across the property, bird habitat, and uh, this is a nesting loop for bluebirds and tree swallows and uh, chickadee. Uh, these are nesting sites for ground nesting bobolinks that have been identified in certain pastures. They come back year after year. And our water quality. Uh, Pecanico Hills is uh, at two ridges. Our entire watershed drains out into Sleepy Hollow. And um, so we feel quite responsible for um, our practices in terms of water recovery and recharge um, and the cleanness of the water that comes out into the Hudson River. Long-term insect habitat and biodiversity continue to be a focus for us and um, we'll continue to build on this. And in many ways, the past few years have just been a starting point for us to set baseline for this work. Um, the technology I'm sure will continue to get better, but most importantly, our attention to this work and um, the capacity for us to uh, show other parks and other communities and other farmers ways to engage in this that are supported by the rest of the community. Um, not, not an added expense to the farmer, but an added value to the entire community. And that's the thing to be honored here is that the work of the farm is not solely to produce food, but to care for the community, soils and the, the society they would live in. Um, so the important part of, of this work, again, um, is that you're able to get to a place of agreement, to have shared language, to be able to set up goals and, uh, and get everyone excited about the work together. Um, in that process, because community is difficult sometimes and complex, it requires work and it requires repeated attention. Uh, it requires you to come back again and again to the table to um, hear each other, to listen to each other's uh, perspective on what's working, what's not working. Um, so, um, a living conservation plan um, or a living archive, a living document is really valuable to bring those people together. In this case, the State Park Preserve, Stone Barn Center, um, our local horse community, 
and even our neighbors and chefs and, and others that are engaged in this work, uh, all participating in what I think not only will make this place more beautiful, but make what's coming out of it um, more appreciated, more delicious, healthier, and uh, a greater resource for all of us. So I'm going to jump out of share here. And um, we'll be glad to maybe answer some questions here for the next 20 minutes or maybe 10 minutes here till the end. And just to let you know, I am doing a deep dive here after this. Uh, hope I'd be able to see you or read the chat. Um, so thank you for, for listening to this much. Um, this is the first time I've given a full uh, presentation on Zoom like this without being able to really see any of the participants. So um, I hope that was good. I would love to be able to see all your faces today. Um, that means a lot to me. So uh, please, if you have some questions, I'd love to be able to answer them. I see some stuff popping up in the chat. So let's see if I can answer those. Jack, just a reminder to check the Q&A at the bottom of your Zoom screen as well. Oh, that's another tab even. Okay, a lot of stuff in here. Um, what kind of beautiful long corn is that in the slide? Yes, thank you. Good question. I like that. That's a great question. That corn is some really special to me. That's autophile. Um, it is um, an eight row flint that comes from New York um, as it, and it's an indigenous root and had been here for uh, you know, many years, many, you know, many millennia, uh, but also became the kind of prized polenta corn in Italy for about 200 years. Um, a friend, Glenn Roberts, handed that corn back to me and asked if I would save it because it was in danger of being lost. Um, I've been raising that, that flint corn now for uh, close to 15 years and saving it. Makes wonderful polenta. Um, um, question here is, it is great that Stone Barns is doing this land stewardship stuff and it's important for small farmers to incorporate the practices, but big ag accounts for something like 70% of all farmland. How do we get them on board? What can be done on that kind of industrial scale? Well, remember that we're the consumers. And um, in this kind of society, at the end of the day, we're the ones that make the choices. Um, the more we know, the more we're associated to regional farming, the more connection we can get back into our natural systems and understand that there is another option, um, we'll see change in that food system. We can only hope for that. Um, we can also um, act politically. Uh, but I think the best way to act is through how you eat, how you buy, and how you act uh, in your day to day. And um, my strategy has been to focus on the local community, to be able to engage as a farmer in this, uh, this place to do something really physical and act. I know a lot of the other farmers I know feel similarly um, and know that we are maybe doing a small thing by just working within our community, but, but nonetheless, the capacity of and an understanding of the people that know this farm and know the food and know the land that this food comes from. Um, I can only hope that they're better consumers in changing the, those big, those big ag ideas. Um, next question is how do you use technology and AI, if at all? And in what ways is it helpful? Um, I'm gonna just jump into this to say that um, Technology has been, you know, it's age old. What's important is that the technology doesn't take away the mastery of your work. Um, so it's always generally a checkpoint for me is that that technology is not making me dumb, uh, but actually improving my understanding of what I'm doing with it, whether that's a tool that I'm using on the farm or a piece of data 
collecting tool or something, it's actually uh, maybe waking me up a little bit or allowing me to do my work um, without more physical labor um, and also without losing my connection to what I'm doing. So there is a lot of technology, the database systems and apps, and phones and drones and all those things. They're all very interesting, um, but they're not a substitute. Um, well, you know, I wish there were more books on, on mutualism. I think I'd have to get back to you on, on some of these, but I would look at books on the subject of, of agroecology in general. Um, you know, a lot of the, the concepts in permaculture um, are, have great value in that way. Um, I think there isn't enough written on, on mutualism in conservation and agriculture. Uh, there's a lot of great design work out there and ideas now um, coming out of different academic institutions. Uh, and there's a lot written on permaculture and old ways. Um, you know, I would, <laughs> the, the book that just came to mind, it would be Braiding Sweetgrass. I guess if I was really gonna look at it just in terms of a, a story that, that discusses reverence, uh, Robin Wall Kimmerer. Um, have you found a reduced need for pesticides or use increased crop diversity and rotation? Absolutely. The diversity, those principles that I put up there earlier um, about mimicking the natural systems, that's what allows you to not be stuck in a system that forces you to use pesticides and herbicides and all those things. Um, they're the cheapest. In the short term, they're the cheapest and most dangerous things. Um, and I think it's really important that we show that there are other ways for value because something like using goats for invasive control is not the easiest. And it's also not the cheapest, but in the long term, it is absolutely better than using herbicides because it's not just an elimination technique, it's a systems change technique. It's a biological approach. And the biological approach will always beat physical and chemical approaches. So I'll leave it at that. I think that's, that could answer just about anything that I would say about greenhouse management or vegetables or pasture rotations. How can we incentivize local and state governments uh, to make community gardens a priority for development? Well, that's a great question. I, I wish we had uh, more time to talk about all of this stuff, but I think that's a good one to maybe end on here. And uh, we can pick up some of these questions after. Just to say, um, community gardens are a touchy business. Um, I think it takes partnering. Um, what I've seen is that those local community gardens have, um, they're such a resource, way beyond food production, but of course the food too. Um, what I've learned is that community gardens are community centers um, and they're food producers, they're hubs for, for interaction and grounding in, in a place that is otherwise um, you know, overtaken. Nature has been overtaken. In the, in the cities. So the community gardens are a refuge and very valuable for state governments to protect or cities to protect, not just as a park, but as a real resource. So it's 2.30. I want to be respectful of everyone's time here. I, I really appreciate um, the questions here. I didn't even get into the depth of this stuff. I'm going to try to answer more of these. Uh, really thank you so much for your, your great questions. Honestly, I, I can't wait to read through some more of these and, uh, you know, consider them myself. And, and hopefully you stick around for this next Zoom that starts right now for the next 45 minutes uh, deep dive. Thank you so much.